also welcome my uh, panelists for the first panel discussion. So this is uh, Web 2 to Web 3. Uh, we are starting uh, with... So I begin with, uh, you know, asking the very uh, basic question uh, on uh, Web 3, you know. Why businesses should, you know, move from Web 2 to Web 3? Why it has become so necessary uh, now? Any of I mean... Okay, you want to... Fine, fine, you can start. I can go first. I don't think companies should move from Web 2 to Web 3. Uh, think about a business. If the company is operating at scale and whatever it is operating with has extremely high needs for trust and it has to be secured by several people saying the same, uh, confirming the same state from everybody, that's probably when you should even explore considering building on a blockchain. I know now is a great time for everybody to think Web3 is the future, we have to do everything on this. But from a computer science standpoint, a blockchain is a really slow database, right? And the reason it is slow is because it is secure and untamperable. And if you need features of untamperability and security in what you're doing, consider moving from Web2 to Web3. Otherwise, Web2 is far more efficient. I would suggest don't go down that rabbit hole. Sorry, that was a <laughs> my towel, but that's, that's how it is. We've spent a lot of time in this market. And because of the hype around this, most people enter this space thinking that it's, you know, uh, about we can make a really, we can make quick money and, you know, we can, uh, you know, build a very big company without really understanding what this brings to the table and whether it's even relevant. So I would say think about that before even, you know, getting to the place that we should move to it. We also have Tarun with us. Welcome, Tarun. Can't hear. Okay, so yes. Amish, if you want to go. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh. Okay, we lost you. Fine. Hey, no problem. Thank you so much for having me and sorry for not making it. Yeah, so we were discussing, you know, why businesses should go from Web 2 to Web 3. We uh, had different views uh, from Raghu. If you had heard, you know, what you have to say. So I agree with Raghu completely. I think uh, what happens with businesses is that, you know, sometimes you just go with the fad and you believe that uh, this is a great thing to do without uh, really understanding the complexity of what you're getting yourself into. Uh, blockchain is a very uh, hard and not easily scalable technology. Uh, you've got to be clear why you really want to bring in that level of transparency, that level of uh, decentralization, that level of shared ownership uh, and what it does to both uh, you as a business but also all your other stakeholders and are they even you know conscious and aware uh, and excited about what you're doing. So um, I think we started on this journey a while ago and I'll talk to you a little bit more uh, on this but I completely echo what uh, Raghu is saying that I think this should be very very well thought through, understood. Um, and the impact on your own business as well as the other stakeholders because their level of education, understanding and acceptability is very different from what you know a techies or a business person should be. Uh, should be weighed in and don't get, in it for, get into it for the short term, right? So this whole scam making of, okay, blockchain token, let's make some money, let's do some ICO, you know, that needs to stop uh, for this to become a long-term sustainable business. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, well, I completely resonate with what Raghu and Tarun did mention. Yes, uh, well, I mean, the first thing we need to be very clear, I mean, are we here to make money or create a value? Yeah, or to both. Yeah, and, and uh, tokenizing ICO as what Tarun mentioned, yes, people look at uh, short term. Well, uh, for me, uh, as a medical practitioner and a serial entrepreneur in my health space, uh, like what uh, Raghu did mention, always keep doing Web 2, yes, we've been, uh, as a hospital in Plexus, we've been doing this Web 2 based applications using these in our ecosystem, but now we have transformed, we've added 
uh, you know, the concept of creating larger value to what we offer into our healthcare system. So that's why, you know, this Web3 is helping me out. So we just started hardly a month old, back we started the first Metaverse experience center in a hospital and wow, that's the feedback which I've got. And, and uh, uh, the blockchain is, is again uh, the, one of the areas where we feel as medical practitioners is going to be a game changer, building more trust to what Tarun did mention, but it is going to take a long time. It is a slow process, adoption is an issue over at this moment. So, you know, as, as, as a startup uh, in uh, uh, early adoption of Web3, I've got that wow value add factor from my own patients who've been, you know, I've been, I've been using these applications on my own patients. And so, so, so the contentment is there. The value is, is, is minuscule, but, but long term registering of that value will take a longer time. So, you know, that's my take on this Web3 transition from Web2 to Web3. Keep continuing Web2 as your front line. But, but we need to adopt, we need to move on, we need to be a differentiated, disruptive, Web3 Web can be a tool to be uh, disruptive, not today but tomorrow. I feel that as one of the you know, approaches, uh, I think I think that I've answered your question. Jeremy, you? Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe first of all, I just want to take a moment to also like, introduce myself. I think uh, this is actually my very first time in Bangalore, so I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me to the Entrepreneur India team. Uh, I, I myself, I'm actually uh, with the GFR fund team. We are an early stage venture fund uh, doing digital media entertainment investments. Uh, specifically within that as well, we look at consumer ventures. So both across Web2, Web3 spectrum, you know, we do investments and we do have portfolio companies across US, EU, and now progressively we're doing a lot more works uh, across India, which is, you know, I think the one of the questions which we'll be chatting about uh, is an area that we're really excited about. Uh, so on the Web3 side of things, uh, two years, well, slightly over two years ago, because, uh, you know, every day in Web3 feels like, you know, a month, right? And I think some of us in the audience uh, see some smiles, so I'm sure you guys can relate to it. Web3 moves very quickly. Uh, so I co-founded Monkey DAO, which is basically a community-owned and operated NFT DAO in the Solana blockchain. And, you know, that continues to be one of the, you know, slightly more active community as, you know, we saw the NFT communities pretty much uh, it came a little bit more muted over the last couple of years or so. Uh, and yeah, so I used to run an NFT marketplace as well as the COO and we have a venture syndicate within the DAO. It's called Monkey Ventures and we only do Web3 investments in that syndicate. Uh, so yeah, sort of uh, going back to this question in terms of like adopting Web3, uh, why businesses should consider that. I think a lot of the points mentioned by the panelists uh, entirely makes sense. I would just add one last point. Uh, the way that we're looking at Web3 is that we are not looking at Web3 from a, from a value, uh, sort of like unique value proposition, right? If you are running a business and you come out and say that, hey, my value proposition is that I have NFTs, I have Web3, I have blockchain. Something could be, you know, fundamentally different or there could be an opportunity to switch it up a little bit because Ideally, what we want to have champion for is the idea that blockchain is a technology. It should be a technology enabler to help you sort of improve, you know, different inefficiencies in what you will see in a traditional business. Is there a way, uh, is that really a need that you should implement Web3 or whatnot? I think you probably should uh, sort of like study out the full journey of your business and, you know, sort of fit it in from there and ask yourself, could this be a technology enabler? Because if it's not uh, relevant for your business, maybe there's no need to jump right into Web3 just yet. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Amit, since you uh, said that you're, you, are, uh, you have adopted Web3 in your hospital in Metaverse, so uh, wanted to know, you know, what are the challenges you faced uh, in the adoption, you know, at your uh, hospital? Uh. I mean, that's a fantastic question. I mean, challenges are phenomenal adoption. I mean, first I need to educate my, uh, you know, my team about, you know, this technology. And then I'm coming from a small tier two city called Rajkot in Gujarat. So, you know, well, I'm based on a Bangalore, but, uh, uh, but Gujarat, you know, tier two city, uh, business city. So technology is, is adoption is a challenge. But uh, on my pilots, which we have learned is these people over there, that is my working colleagues, are hunger for doing something very unique. 
So that's why I felt that, uh, you know, educating my team to, to implement this in their ecosystem. And then putting that, giving that uh, tool or the web, web three tool to my patients. Uh, so it took early, you know, challenges, the VR headsets, then, then, then sitting on the computers, I mean on the tabs, uh, educating them about what exactly we are looking at uh, and not the results part, but, but at least uh, applying that. So it was a challenge, but uh, you know, now people are asking me, I mean, made up a specific, doc, give me more. What is something which I can, you know, you know, feel good about you. So, so as a value add to my healthcare system, so Metaverse is helping me out. I mean, I, you won't believe on my use cases. One of my patients said, Doc, you were not able to identify a cause of my headache. And uh, with this solution, my headache is gone. At least for at least for half an hour or one hour. Give me more. So I feel that is a, you know, problem statement. And then see the results. It is just a matter of time. It's just educating and just a matter of time. Can you also uh, walk us through, you know, uh, like you talked about the challenges, but how you have adopted it in your hospital means, are they just value added or actual use cases? Actual, uh, in Metaverse, I mean specific, uh, there are few domains which we have touched upon. One is uh, empowering the patient, number one. I mean, uh, you example, as a patient, uh, would you uh, beforehand uh, go online, search for the hospital, search for the doctor? And then you would love to see the web-based hospital, how the rooms would look at, how the, the entire hospital will look at. So we have created a hospital in Metaverse. So sitting in, uh, you know, uh, uh, a patient comes in in our experience center would get the entire walkthrough of the hospital, about the doctor, about his facility. My avatar will, would really educate him. So, so, so uh, apprehension can be, you know, reduced. Knowledge about the hospital and the doctor is something which I am aiming it just come down. So this is patient specific and disease specific. For example, I mean you want to know something about your uh, a cabinet surgery, a, a bypass surgery. So the entire surgical video has been shown on a metaverse solution. So that uh, uh, registry of that information is more uh, impactful than seeing it on a simple uh, uh, 2D model, 3D model and on the YouTube app. So that registry, I'm feeling it more, so, so building more trust. Patients are loving it. So this is on the patient, on the disease perspective. And then, you know, education about, you know, uh, the patient, about uh, the disease, the wellness, and then skill mapping and development for my own medical team, for, for my doctors and for my paramedics. So I am working on a project, uh, you know, we're working on the content, where I educate my junior cardiologists about the surgical procedure sitting remotely. So, so better was going to really, you know, you know, bridge this and I'm, I, I, I get goosebumps even the thought of it. We, we, we can have planned this about six months back. So there's a company in, in Delhi called Metaverse 911. Rahul and Rohit are my, you know, co-partners in my ecosystem. So we've created an amazing application where, you know, a doctor will learn from this solution. And imagine a small, you know, village where there's a surgical complication, a surgeon is not able to, you know, learn or do about a complex procedure. This is where the solution is. So adoption is going to be a challenge, but I don't see a challenge in, uh, in, in healthcare perspective where, you know, we've been uh, doing these pilots earlier, like you said, AI solutions in five years back was a challenge. I mean, I have more than 50 villages where I have started AI clinics in rural Gujarat, a digital heart clinics in Gujarat. A patient is, a patient can see a cardiologist sitting in Antarctica or North Pole or whichever globe. Medicine. So Metaverse is going to bridge this. So my next study is going to be putting Metaverse in a rural village. So the impact is phenomenal. So, so patients will definitely are loving me for the clinic base which I have started and now a new value added. And imagine a hospital, a doctor doing a procedure for a patient. Okay, great, great. Uh, Jeremy, I want to come to you and ask, uh, you know, uh, within Web3 startups, you have to invest, you know, what sort of uh, startup you would, you know, go for? That's, that's an interesting question. I mean, the landscape obviously have changed, you know, from uh, 2021. And, you know, one thing that we have noticed is that, you know, Web3 a lot of times is, as much as we hate to admit it, is an, is an attention economy. 
So what that means is that, you know, sort of the tension and the hype shifts from one meta to another. Meta for, you know, sort of uh, the, the rest of us as, as a reference, if we may not be so familiar, is basically the cool thing, right? Where everyone is looking at it, where everyone is spending time. So we've seen how things change from like NFT, DeFi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at the end of the day, today we are like two, three years in after the initial bull run. Uh, a lot of things have started to calm down. The good thing is that consolidation has happened, right? Uh, similar to any other technology. In the early days of VR, AR, we've seen how many of the interesting applications come out. So today for Web3 specifically, you know, uh, there will always be individuals uh, who are working on interesting things like GameFi and whatnot. But fundamentally, where we are looking from uh, it as a uh, looking at it from a fund's perspective is how is this Web three or blockchain technology, sorry, blockchain uh, used as a technology enabler? So we always go that go back to that as like a guiding principle. And I think where there could be interesting opportunities is thinking about it from an infrastructure perspective. The good thing about infrastructures is that regardless of how you sort of like build it, uh, you don't have to be betting on the attention economy, right? The infrastructures are in place because you help to facilitate different platforms, different protocols, different games, different titles, and put them you know, onto whatever you know, uh, platform that they should be. Facilitate them, uh, give them the right tools that they need. So what this means that is that you don't have to bet on the attention economy, right? Is it may not have to be dependent on the heat driven cycle. Uh, any sort of protocol that is successful, any partner that is successful, your infrastructures can benefit from it. So that is one of the many ways to think about it. Of course, uh, you know, other opportunities continue to exist, uh, but where we as GFR fund, you know, is sort of focused at least, you know, is looking at like infrastructures and sort of coming up from the perspective of how can these be used to onboard the masses. Jeremiah. Okay, I. Uh, this is my question to you know all the panelists. So, what the future looks like for you know Web three adoption and uh, will partnership and collaboration you know they'll play some. Uh, Tarun, I want to hear you on this first. So I think uh, the first people that you know you've got to partner with is your key stakeholders who are going to use your technology, right? <laughs> In a consumer tech platform like ours. Our big partnership first is with our users. Uh, we are a community platform. We chose uh, to adopt blockchain into our scheme of things only because we realized that communities find it easy to govern themselves through a transparent mechanism on the blockchain. But we've been very careful on how we get our folks to adopt it, right? Uh, at the stage one, we made sure that all their efforts on the community platform were tokenized uh, and, you know, there was clear transparency around in a community who does what and how much and you know they all uh, clearly understood the efforts that were being put in by each one of them towards building the community. At the second level, we want to then take this data real time onto the chain so that they can all then uh, have access to that information real time and it's also tokenized for a long term future you know listing or whatever they want to do as community members around what they've done, uh, you know, in the value that they've created. So I think the, the entire process is driven by making sure that the partners first understand what we're doing. So uh, at the first level, they know that their efforts are worth something. Then they know that their efforts are being measured. Then they know that collective governance together can create value for the efforts that they've done and it is up to them to be able to take that decision in a decentralized manner, understanding what each of their voting powers are, each of their responsibilities are, each of their options are, and then building that value together. And so <clears throat> this entire process is actually in our head charted over almost three years because at the first level it's just community building and making sure that you know everybody's roles are defined and everybody's contributions are me measured. Then it's about giving them a certain amount of decentralization in taking decisions together on the basis of those of voting powers and the efforts they're taking. And then it's about deciding the way they want to monetize that effort, whether they want to allow 
you know, people to be able to train the ownership or whether they want to allow the entire block to be able to list themselves and do something worthwhile. And that all depends on each community's ability to create value. And there are about 7,000 communities on the platform. So it really, you know, we know that, you know, about 5% of them will shine. They will end up creating a lot more value. They could end up being really big. And then there will be some, you know, who will just use this as a web tool, loyalty token, and possibly never get into really digitizing or doing something for themselves. But it's all decentralized. It's all upon them to be able to take that decision and move forward. I want to hear from all of you, uh, Raghu, yeah. On uh, the future. On the future of Web3 uh, mass adoption and the role of partnerships and collaboration. Okay, I, I think I can take the first one when I don't interface with the corporate world as much to uh, figure out where partnerships and collaboration are. Of course, there have been experiments uh, to do this. Most recent one that I heard was Pixar using renders, crowdsourced GPUs for uh, uh, you know processing a lot of their anim uh, secondary and ancillary animations. I thought that that was a very interesting use case. Uh, look, I think if you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm like I'm now on the other side of 35, so I have seen two cycles of different technologies. So when Android and iOS was a thing, everybody wanted to talk about how mobility is the next big thing. When it did become the next big thing, everyone just kind of was like, yeah, what's new with that, right? It just kind of integrates yourself into your life. Cloud computing is another thing. Every service that we use today, whether that's a Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever you use, it is on the cloud. Nobody talks about cloud computing anymore. I, if Web3 works, if this blockchain thing works, uh, you wouldn't think of it as it's a blockchain thing. It's like completely hidden in the, in the background. Uh, and then that's how it should be. It's actually a behind the scenes technology. It is not so much a in front of the scene. So that's on the tech bit itself. The other part is tokenization. And I would strongly recommend to not, you know, villainize it as much as it has been done before. Uh, we, I, I still remember now, you know, a lot of people come in and say, you know, what is the token useful for? Why do you buy these monkey face tokens? And I still remember somebody telling me who was a part of the early internet revolution. And they'd say that when we were talking about the internet, that's how everyone looked at us and spoke to us about. So every time there is something that's new, uh, we are quick to shy away from it, that no, it doesn't make sense to me with the world view that I have, and so I must hide away from it. But I truly think that tokenization is real. It's here. Take, and I'll give you one example. USDC, which is US dollar circle, is a, is a very, very regulated play from the US that has increased the distribution of the dollar in no other way still be. Right? Everybody today has access to the US dollar if you have a cryptocurrency wallet which was unheard of. It, I would say everyone keeps talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum is like the biggest thing for mass adoption. I'd say it's USDC, right? Like USDC is insanely amazing and it is only possible because of tokenization. You need to have Ethereum. You need to have the security of Ethereum to prove that the circulating supply of USDC equals the total number of dollars that are sitting in your treasury. Right, and that is absolutely necessary for it to happen. So that's and, and as a business, USDC makes to the tune of eight hundred million dollars a quarter. Right, eight hundred million dollars a quarter it makes it, and this is possible because Jeremy Allier was open to the idea of tokenization. And so I'd say yes, there is a lot of noise. Any permissionless space creates a lot of noise. But there is a lot of signal in there as well, which if we zone into, it will become true. So you will experience blockchain through cryptocurrency. But the technology itself, you will have nothing to do with. It, it, uh, the, I'll just leave you with that one line. There's uh, uh, you know, Dan Romero from Farcaster. Uh, Farcaster is an alternative to Twitter that you can check out. Uh, it's, it's a much nicer place if you are like me, who's just tired of the vitriol on Twitter and you want to go to a slightly more positive place, go to go to Parkaster. 
He calls it like it's a web two. It, it's called the web three mullet. You know, a mullet is basically a hairstyle which looks like a formal hairstyle in the front and like long hair in the back. Okay, it was a big thing in the eighties. And so, the web three mullet is basically a web two front end that it will not look any different from any of the apps that you guys are using right now, but a web three back end which actually uses the features of security, permissionlessness at the back, uh, and that's how I would like the future of Web3 to run. Because if I knew that was the future, I think I would be uh, much richer than what I am right now. So, so yeah, that's, that's my two cents. Sharma, your view, then I'm yeah, I, I, I just want to point out the, the funny thing he mentioned about the monkey tokens because I'm a, I'm a big fan of, you know, monkey tokens. Uh, if you are interested, you can have a conversation after this. Uh, but yeah, just aside, I think one thing that I just wanted to highlight, I think everything that was mentioned you know, completely makes sense. But I think one thing that is really unique when you look at Web3 and Web2 is that moving forward as we go, you know, over the next couple of months, years, Web3 and Web2 will converge. What does success look like for us as an industry? Success for us as an industry is successful when we no longer have to use the word Web3 and Web2. Think about the uniqueness of Web3 and Web2, right? And how can we harness you know, the uniqueness of Web3 into Web2 businesses? And I sort of like encourage or rather implore all of us to think about this on a, on a further scale uh, in depth, which is the fact that Web3 has really highlighted the value of community and enablement, all right? Tokenization and, and whatnot. Blockchain allows us to organize, you know, communities at scale. Is this something unique? Not really, because if you think about it, interest groups and whatnot, they used to exist since years ago, right? Uh, individuals who like sports car or whatever, they tend to congregate anyway. So are all these communities actually unique or like game-changing? Not really. But what is really special about it is the ability to organize individuals, groups, globally at scale. So if you think about this and maybe explore different ways that you can harness a Web2 business with that element of community incentivization, that can go a long way. Because what that allows you to achieve is an organic flywheel. An organic flywheel where you know, the meta is no longer about let's raise funds, let's pump all the money into user acquisition, and hope that it sticks. When you have an organic flywheel, you know, things are easier and you have natural ambassadors. So I think that is like the biggest value add of Web3 as a whole, as we've seen how it has transited. Uh, I mean, you can briefly, you know, uh, your last Yeah, I, I completely agree uh, with what you said. Um, well, future. I see a greater future of Web3 uh, blockchain in healthcare. I mean, right from pharmaceutical to value add for uh, patients, for doctors. And uh, yes, as a medical practitioner, I see you know, collaboration as one of the key and uh, you know, a disruptive collaboration uh, would definitely bring in you know, uh, uh, amazing results both in financially as well as in creating a larger value in going with the latest advancement in Web3. So, you know, I summarize, yes, this is the future. And uh, me being an earlier doctor uh, using this Web3, and the next is approach of my company is going to be on blockchain where, you know, we're going to do a pilot on uh, healthcare related, insurance related, uh, you know, you know, POCs which really, you know, enhance the trust with more credible solutions and bridge the gap between the patient and the doctor. So I see amazing results ahead. Uh, we are running late, so we have to end this session here. I thank all my panelists for such an insight, insightful session. Thank you. <laughs>